So, um, hey, a quick thing um, on, on uh, volunteering. So if you're new to Calgary, we want you to actually sit, absorb, grow, get to know how we do stuff, and make sure you're in line with us. And, uh, and the gospel you preach is the same as the gospel you preach. But as God stirs you up, if you've been here for a while, and we're going to talk about that briefly, um, is when the Holy Spirit gets in a person, he fills him up so that it can overflow in expressions of abusing the callings that God has given us. So um, you will have seen me tonight um, being cameraman and last week being worship leader and a number of things. So I'm not necessarily, um, I can do that. It's not my primary calling. So if you have a gift um, in some way that you want to share with us, um, COVID's been an interesting time, right? Because we've kind of been like hunkering down and it's been a convenient kind of hunkering down because you always wanted to sit on that gift you had anyhow. <laughs> and now it's a great opportunity, right? Because why should I you know, get up and use it? Because I could give someone COVID or something somehow, you know. Um, in the Proverbs it says, uh, the fool says there's a line in the street. And the implication is that he won't do anything outside of his house because it's dangerous out there. And it's dangerous to be involved. And yet God would have us do exactly the other thing. But that's the Bible says that the righteous are bold as lions. So we should be out there confronting the lions, not hiding from them. Um, you see that all through the scripture, Nehemiah, when he was building the walls, that people were telling him, hey, you should just go into the temple, you should hide out because there's people out to kill you. And he's like, look, I've got a job to do, and I don't have time for this kind of nonsense. So that's a challenge for us. Um, if, if God's gifted you, um, then put it to use. And, um, you know, as one great American said, damn the torpedo <coughs> is going to ahead. Um, did I just say that? When the kids were in, never use that word in kids. Um, unless you're friends, unless it's in a good sense. So I know that uh, kids are in here. So I kind of forgot. Um, we're going to talk about the coming of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit uh, today. And so I want to take a look at that. The title is Anticipation is Making You Wait, and you don't have that video. Okay. I had an anyone, what is that? When you hear that, anticipation is making me wait, what do you think of? Dan? Marty? Let's bring a song to mind. <laughs> There you go, okay. I know some of those older people would remember a Carly Simon song called Anticipation is Making Me Wait. And it's like, Anticipation is making me wait, keeping me waiting. And then all the verses about other stuff. But Anticipation. And then it was such a great song that Heinz Ketchup adopted that for their commercials. You remember that? Heinz Ketchup is... Yes. Slow, good. And the guy would come in, or the kid would be sitting there with a friend or something, and they'd be waiting for it. Such good ketchup, but it's worth the wait. Oh, wow. Well. Do we have it? Oh, wrong song. Different. No videos of that? That's a different one. It's not the same song. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, forget it. Okay, nice try though. They're working at it. Um, but yeah, okay, so we'll, we'll just move on from that. Anticipation is making me wait, a little kid waiting, the catch it slowly coming out onto the French fries. And you're like just beginning to drool on them as you're waiting. And so I want to talk about something uh, that's a biblical idea and it's to wait. This is a different kind of wait than in the Psalms where it says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage and he'll strengthen your heart. Um, or some of the other verses that say, wait on the Lord, because those are wait like a waiter waits. A waiter doesn't sit down and, and you know, just let you serve yourself, right? They get, they get up and serve you. So when it says, wait on the Lord, most of the time it's talking about us actually getting busy in uh, doing God's business, doing stuff. Uh, that God's called us to do, wait on Him, but make Him our primary preoccupation. But this is a different kind of wait. This is the one that your parents tell you, sit still, right? Wait, sit down is actually in the book of Luke, to sit down. And to just not 
get preoccupied with doing stuff every time. Well, when is that the case? You know, because COVID has taught us how to hunker down, which is kind of like a foxhole mentality, but I don't believe that that's what this is. This is actually sit, wait, anticipate that it's coming. It's slow, good, but it's good because God has something for us. So let's take a look at that passage in the book of Luke, and then we're going to have some fun where we are actually going to have a panel, which is going to involve four kids, my wife being one of them, and then three other kids that we've chosen at random from the church who are going to help us answer a couple questions um, about their parents. Like, do your mom and dad fight? Yes. <laughs> no, not the way out there. A couple of parents are like, okay, I'm taking our kid out right now. Um, hey, Anna Smith, it's good to see you back here. Anna, is this the first time I've seen you, baby? No. 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 I, it's the first time I've thought to mention it, so I know she's here with me, baby. Luke and Anna, you know, did that. So, okay. Um, so the book of Acts, chapter 1. Now, in the book of Acts, remember, it's a continuation of another book that uh, Luke wrote. And what was the name of that book? Count me out, kids. Luke wrote two books. One of them called the book of Acts. The other one is called... Luke. Luke. Very good. It's called the book of Luke. It's the story of Jesus from his birth till his death and resurrection till he went to heaven. Now, the book of Acts begins where that stopped. Because, now, so here's what happened, is the disciples, the night before Jesus died, were in this room or with Jesus. They just had a meal, and Jesus was talking about going away. That made them very sad. It made them sad, like, you might feel sad if your parents are like, I'm going on a long trip, I'm not sure when I'm coming back. But he said, I'm going away, but don't freak out, don't be worried, because I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send a comforter. Over and over and over, Jesus talked about something that was coming next. And the book of Acts talks about what came after Jesus died, was resurrected, and went to heaven again to be with the Father. What came next is the coming of the Holy Spirit, and that transformed everything. Everything was changed by that. So let me read the passage. It says, um, it, we're not going to go through the first verses. We're going to pick up at verse 4. While Jesus was still on earth, he was staying with them, and he ordered them. Here's his command. He said, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized you in water, and there are some here who have been baptized in water. As a as to show that they love Jesus, they want to walk with him. They've been baptized because they've given their life to him. But John, he said, baptized with water. But Jesus said, but you, according to John, will be baptized with the Holy Spirit um, not many days from now. So just like going into the water, they would come up again. A new person, the Bible talks about a baptism, a complete immersion is for the believer. That um, some believe is how the church started. I believe that it's not just how the church started. It's something that's for every believer. Now that's biblical. Um, and so we need to accept that. Because even if you don't accept the baptism of the Holy Spirit as something separate from salvation. Paul says that you should be filled with the Spirit. And that word is continually filled. In other words, it's an experience of the Holy Spirit in our life is something that everyone should experience and can experience. Now, how old do you have to be to experience that? No age. No age? Well, I don't know. What about at birth? What about before you're born? Do you think you can be filled with the Holy Spirit? Okay, we're starting to panel already. Well, the Bible says that John was filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. And so it's something I believe that God has for everyone. I was three years old when God baptized me in the Holy Spirit. Whatever you want to make of that, but I had an experience with God that was an experience with the Holy Spirit that was very dynamic at three years old because I wanted that. I asked him, and he gave it. And so here's a cool thing. Jesus, when talking about the Holy Spirit, said this in the book of Matthew. He said, you know, dads, if your son or your daughter asks you for bread, you don't give them a rock, do you? I mean, kids, what would you think if you asked your dad, hey, dad, can I ask your dad? He's like, here, do you want this? Yeah. 
Or you say, I'd like an egg, and he's like, here's a snake, a biting snake, a poisonous snake, enjoy that. Or I'd like some fish, here, have a scorpion. And, and that's what Jesus said. It was crazy to even think that that. And he said, how much more if you, being good as parents, or being evil as parents, know how to give good things to your kids, how much more will your Father in heaven give? And he said it two different ways. In Matthew 1, way, but in the book of Luke, he said it this way. How much more will your Father in heaven give what? The Holy Spirit to those who have I think there's been so much misrepresentation of what the Holy Spirit does, and, and the people have been freaked out by that. You know, Lisa was freaked out the first time she went to the church, one of the churches I was raised in, where they're doing backflips down the aisle. Well, that would freak a few people out. But I think we've become so freaked out that we're afraid to even ask, because if we ask, God might give us a rock instead of the Holy Spirit. Or a scorpion instead of the Holy Spirit, or a snake instead of the Holy Spirit. God says, uh uh, you ask and you can trust me. No matter what label men put on her, no matter how men or women misrepresent this or make it look like something that it's not, if you ask, I will give you. It is my promise. So the first thing in this passage, and then I haven't even finished reading the whole passage yet, but it's a promise. There's a promise. And that's all through the New Testament. And the Old Testament, the promise is something incredible, dynamic and powerful. The second is a command to wait. And the third is the empowerment. That is, when this comes, what does that look like? And you can read the book of Acts. It changes everything in everyone's life who is filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, he goes on to say, well, stay with him. He ordered not to go out of Jerusalem. He said, wait. Stay right here. Epi, epimeno, I believe is the word. Just stay around, stick around right here. Um, and wait for something, the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. John baptized with water, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not long from now, which would actually be 10 days. They waited 10 days. That's a long time to wait. Right? No. No? What about Christmas time? That gift gets stuck out under the tree. And it's that thing you're pretty sure you wanted. And that's like two days before, and you're like, I can't wait. And so you open it prematurely, and don't tell your parents about it. We're going to ask about that, maybe, tonight. So he said, not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, they were thinking now still in Old Testament terms. Old Testament was that the king, Jesus, the Messiah, would come, would take control, and set up his kingdom. Now the Jews, when they uh, asked for Jesus to cru be crucified, rejected their Messiah. And so God said, I'm going to do something. I'm going to set that aside by dealing with them as a people and setting up the kingdom for them for a time, but not permanently. I'm going to come back and I'm going to bookmark you guys for a time. And I'm going to give every person that's not Jewish and the Jews and together a chance to all come into something called the church. And that's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that, that new thing that God was doing, came about. But they were asking about that because they thought, okay, Jesus, you resurrected from the dead. Now it's time to wipe out the Romans and set up your kingdom. And they said, is it time? What are you going to do? Are you going to do it? Are you going to do it? They kept asking him. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or season the Father is fixed by his own authority. In other words, God's in charge of that and you need to let that go. And quit hanging on to that. You're hanging on to your vision of your kingdom and what that looks like. Let me tell you something better though. Not this, or not that, but this. But, in place of that, you're going to get something much, much better. Here's what you're going to get. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And the power is not just so you can jump around and go, Glory! I feel the power! It's so that you actually can do something with it. And what do you do with it? What's he say right here in this passage? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will overflow of the power coming in. You will be my witnesses. In other words, when God gets in a life, it begins to change and people see the difference manifested. There's a difference, and it changes you. 
you know, some of us, unfortunately, are looking maybe a long time in the Lord and a lot of experience of failure and powerlessness. But the story and what Jesus said is the same today as it was then, that the power of God is the thing that transforms you. You don't need more power of man. You don't need to dig in the dumpster of your past more. You need the power of God to transform every aspect of your being. And so the power of God that changed man is the same power that has the capacity to change you now. And the problem, I think, a lot of times is we're holding on to the dock and to the boat. We want to go in the boat with the power of the Holy Spirit. But when we get, start casting out into the deep, it freaks us out, so we get back on the dock. And then we wonder why our lives are powerless. And it's because we haven't set sail with what God wants for us. But he says, I want you to do three things. But there's three things here. He's telling them, he's saying, basically, there's a promise. And there's a command about that promise. And then there's a fulfillment of that promise, which involves the empowering of every believer to be a witness. That means you yourself will be a witness. What's a witness to do? Anyone, what's a witness? Well, this is something, again, I probably need to ask the, the kids, but, yeah, because it's probably a long explanation, but what's a witness do? Simple story. They tell about something that they saw. And, and what's going to happen is our lives are going to manifest, or they're going to show what we know. We know Jesus, and that begins to show up on the outside in the way we do, what we do. It's going to manifest. And so he said, you'll receive power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. You'll be my witnesses. And then he gives basically the formula for the rest of the book of Acts. It'll be like this. You'll be here in this most sinful place in the world that crucified the Lord. It'll begin in Jerusalem. And then it will go out from there to Judea, the place around where all the Jewish people were still. It'll go to that. And then to Samaria. This is the place that was, they kind of hated the Jews. The Jews hated them. But you're going to take it there first. And then to the whole world. And that's what you'll see in the book of Acts. What happens when God's Spirit begins just very organically working in people. It's like a natural thing. You know, instinct is interesting, isn't it? How an animal can be born and know exactly what it's supposed to do. Like, you know, hummingbirds don't try and, you know, walk around and scratch open dumpsters like bears, you know. They're, they're born to do something that they instinctively know. You know marsupials like kangaroos is it, or whatever that are born and then crawl up into that pouch. How do they know that stuff? And so when God's Spirit gets in us, though, it's like it makes us alive for the very thing that we were born for and born to do. So, let me read you these. I'm going to talk about the promises. I'm going to talk about the command briefly. And then, um, and then uh, we'll have the panel come up after we talk about the environment. So, the promise. Jesus said this. I'm going to ask the Father. This is the book of John 14. I'm going to ask the Father, and he'll give you another Savior, a helper, actually. The Holy Spirit of truth. Now, the word for helper there is parakletos. It means one who comes alongside to help. So the Holy Spirit is a paracletos, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside to help you. Do you need someone to help you do what's right, to help you when you're sad, to guide you to make better decisions, to help you actually be, feel sorry and change your behavior? That's what the Holy Spirit does. He's not just putting a finger on you, the foot on your neck and saying, you're a bad person. He's actually there to help. That's what the law says how bad we are, but the Spirit comes along and gives us the ability, the wings to fly. The law says, you can't fly, and you think, well, maybe I'll flap my arms a little harder, and then I'll be able to fly, but you can't because you're not designed that way. But when the Holy Spirit comes into you, you receive power, you receive lift, the ability to do something impossible. And we see that all through the book of, of Acts. And it's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit, not so much the Acts of the Apostles. And so then he, he goes on, he says, I won't leave you. The world won't receive him because they can't see him or not, but you know it intimately because he remains with you and will live inside you. I promise, I promise, it's a promise. I will never leave you, helpless or abandon you as orphans. I will come back to you. And he came back. 
and has been back in his Holy Spirit, and he will come back physically to the earth again. Then he says in, in John 14, 25 to 27, I'm telling you these things now while I'm still with you. But when the Father sends the Advocate, again, this is the um, Paracletos, as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I've told you. That's good because we need reminding, right? I don't know if you're like me, but I forget. Lisa can tell me something. I'm like, yes, ma'am, I will do that. And forget five minutes later. Very convenient, um, actually. But it really, some of the times it's forgetting, and sometimes it's just because I selected memory. And he says, but I'm going to help you remind you, and I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart, and the peace I give is a gift the world can't give, so don't be troubled or afraid. And then, John 15, 26, he said, I'll send you the divine encourager from the very presence of my Father. He will come to you, the Spirit of truth, emanating from the Father, and will speak to you about me. And you'll tell everyone the truth about me, for you have walked with me from the very start. God wants to send this promise. He's promised it. In fact, in one place in the book of John, it says that Jesus walked into the temple and said, Hey, whoever believes on me, out of his inmost being will flow rivers of living water. It was kind of a picture of what happens when you're so full of God that God is just overflowing from you. And as God's coming in and overflowing, guess what happens to the riverbed or to the water hose that is flowing through? It gets cleaned up, right? So many of us are like, wait, wait, God, when I get cleaned up, then I'll let you use me. And God says, let me use you, and that will be the process of cleaning you. I'll, I'll get all that crud out of your life. I'll, I'll work with you as you walk with me. And so he wants to fill us so that we can overflow and flow out. And so there's the promise, and then there's the, um, the command that God has given us. He said that the command is simply to wait. There are times when the best thing you can do is to not proceed, but to wait. To not make a move. You almost always have something you can do in the meantime. You said, occupy till I come. In other words, stay busy doing stuff till I get back. But there's same decisions that the church even can make that we probably need to sit on. I have a problem here. I get a little impatient sometimes and can drive an agenda. Um, and that will come back to bite me, as my leaders can attest to. But God is gracious and good, and he teaches us to walk with him and to wait on him. And so sometimes, maybe you're in a crisis right now, where the best thing you can do is not make a decision like, I'm going to leave my husband now, or I'm going to leave my wife now and start a new life, but maybe it's just, I need to wait on order. Maybe it's, I need to go out and find, because God hasn't been doing anything, I'm going to take this in my own hands and go find a relationship to get into, because I'm tired of being lonely. Or my husband is such a dullard, and my wife is so mean. And, and you're going to find something else. And God would say, wait. Wait for specific guidance. Well, you say, how will I know when it's God? Let me ask you, how did the disciples know it was the Holy Spirit when you finally came? Do you think there was any question in their mind whether the Holy Spirit was poured out? When it happened? Book of uh, Acts, chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there was a sound, there was a... There was visual something they saw, and then there was something inside of them that changed them for eternity. And so it was a command to say, God, I believe, just it's something to keep in mind that there's times where the Holy Spirit says, wait, and where Jesus says, wait. Don't have, don't work out your agenda right now. Just walk with me and trust me. And I'm going to open this. And then there's the last thing we have power, and that's when the Holy Spirit poured out. Chuck Smith, Pastor Chuck Smith, had five things that he said were outlets for the power. He said basically this, he said that there's only one inlet for the spiritual power, for spiritual power, and that's through the Holy Spirit. That's how it comes in. But there's at least five different ways that can come out. Because, right, it fills you up so it can come out from you. I mean, what happens when something just fills and fills and fills? What do we call that? 
What do you call that in, in water? When it comes to water, something is just a feeling. It never has an outflow. Overflowing? Floating. Not overflowing. If it isn't overflowing, what does that water become? What? Stagnant. Yes, it becomes a swamp, a marsh. Or the Dead Sea. Water comes into that. It's so far below sea level, it can't go uphill to get out to the ocean. And it just sits there, evaporates, evaporates, until that water is so full of minerals and stuff, which are really great and all. But I can tell you, I went like splashing into that, and I could look at, yes, and splash some in my eyes. It's like, oh, find your way back to the shore. <laughs> and stumble back because I couldn't see anything. Um, but it becomes bad. And so God wants us to not only take in, He fills us so He can pour out. So just keep that in mind. And here's the ways that, that, that he um, overflows by the elements of this power. And I think this is pretty comprehensive. First of all, it's your life. When, when you become full of the Spirit of God, there's just the way your life expression, not just the way you look at life, but the way people look at you. We used to probably tell the story in a minute, but I'll tell it for her now so she doesn't have to. But when she gave her life to the Lord, that was a crazy experience. She almost just stumbled upon Jesus and surrendered to him, but the next day she went down to the cafeteria and they're like, whoa, you got saved, didn't you? You gave your life to Jesus. And because everything became different. The Holy Spirit was on her. Her life was transformed and began to be transformed. So her life will change. But I believe also for the believer that's accepted Jesus is we need to be open to the work, the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, because that's transformative. It didn't stop when you walked the aisle or when you said yes to Jesus. It's actually something that should be going on every day. So your life is an outlet. Your words, the way you talk, saying bad words, like I said, a bad word. And so you know what I do when I do something and I feel bad about it? I do this. Jesus, I'm sorry I said that. Forgive me, help me to watch what I say, cleanse my mouth, and like that, and then I go on. But the wonderful thing is, is that the Holy Spirit does give us, that's why I think they spoke in tongues at first, as God was saying, I'm going to control even what you say, and, and I'm going to use that to actually do something amazing. And they spoke in languages they didn't even know. Now, whatever you believe in, you're going to walk out and say, this is a Baptist church and it's talking about tongues. Well, first of all, they're in the Bible. My experience as a three-year-old was, um, I don't know what to say, but that's what happened to me. Um, and, and I don't necessarily believe that you have to speak in tongues um, to be saved or to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But it's a thing, and I don't think that went away at the early church. Because when you start picking and choosing what gifts and what things the Holy Spirit went away, you get on dangerous ground, don't you? And so, the words we speak and the way we serve are helping others. There's a new desire to actually use what you have. And that becomes because it comes because God lights up a part of you. And it's something that you're really passionate about. Let's say you're really passionate about a Lego people, men. Or something. Uh, or you have something that God has just clicked on in your head or, or for you know certain things. And, and God will often take those and just you know pour power in them and actually enable that to be something that serves the world. It's something that becomes a gift that you can use to help others. So in our helping, so our life and our words and our helping, in our giving of stuff. Now, point blank, that means money, but it also means stuff. And you're like, oh boy, here it comes. That's right, here it comes. If God has touched your life and you're not giving, something's wrong. You're a dead sea. Because when you look at what happened very naturally in the book here of Acts, the very first thing they did is they sold everything, had everything in common. They're like, okay, this is an important time. This is worth getting, selling everything and just buying into this thing. Because this cryptocurrency is going to give a big return, right? They poured everything into that. And later they actually were very impoverished and needed help of the Gentiles. 
because they've given so much away. But I believe that they all considered it worth the cost because they were paying into something to pay the return of the dividends. And we don't count you know, the return based on how it looks at the end of the year, the end of five years or 10 years at the end of what is, you know, our, when our gold or our stuff is in heaven when we get into eternity. But giving our stuff will be a part. And let me just say that as long as I'm there. Um, I know COVID has kind of affected a lot of stuff, but frankly, the giving is quite down for Calvary. I mean, we still have enough to get by. Um, some of that is because we've lost people, but I wonder if some of it's because in hunkering down physically, we've also hunkered down financially. Now, that's fine if you want to do that, if that's something God moved you to do, but the natural movement of a, spirit, of a person that's filled with the Holy Spirit is to give in numerous ways. And it would make me wonder if, if someone stopped giving here, did they stop giving every other place too? And chances are they have. If someone stopped giving here and is placing it somewhere else for the kingdom of God, that's, you know, again, that's between you and God. I don't look at who gives and who doesn't. But it is interesting that this time would have that effect because I think it's affecting every area of us. And the Holy Spirit wants to affect every area of us powerfully and get us out of that funk that we're in. So giving your stuff. And then lastly, he said that the Holy Spirit, when it gets into your life, will affect the way you pray. It won't be just reciting something, you know, our Father 50 times with no meaning. You see that in the book of Acts, that when they prayed, it was powerful. The place was shaken, it said, when they prayed this prayer. I don't know. I think that meant the building literally shook. And God was like saying, Amen. Yes. That's the kind of prayer I want. But the prayer wasn't, Oh God, people are mad at us. We're going to hide in our houses. Would you please protect us? No, they said, God, people are mad at us. They're doing mean things to us. They're even hurting us. But give us boldness to not hunker down at a time that's probably the most salient, most powerful time in history to preach the gospel to a world that's very hungry and very lost and needs to hear it. God, help us to get out into the streets and take this out of the privacy of our home and begin working again because the night is coming when no man can work. And so they were activated and their prayer was motivational and it was praying that God would make them powerful witnesses because this is what God said would happen when the Holy Spirit came upon them is they would become witnesses throughout the world. And they said, help us to do that better, God, because I think we might start flunking at this if we look at what's going on against us. And you know, God took the very thing that was against them and used that as a very powerful force to drive them out into the other parts of the world. They had hunkered down in Jerusalem and God caused persecution to begin to happen. And they moved out because of the persecution and began sharing around the world. God can use the worst of circumstances to motivate us to do the best of things, which is to be a witness in the world of Him. That's how God designed us. You, you will not be content, believer, hunking or hunkering down in your home, cowering, and waiting for the lion in the street to get away. You will not be content. There will be a sense of discontent, and a sense of lostness, and a lack of purpose, and the very thing that probably drove you to the Lord often was a lack of purpose, a hopelessness. And God said he came to give us a future, and a hope and a future has to do with the goal that he's got us moving toward. And of course we're going to feel hopeless, and of course we're going to feel purposeless if we're not moving toward that goal that he set up for us. And so the Holy Spirit will stir a fire in you, a fire that can't be contained. It's like a fire in your bones that you, something in you says, I must do something about a world that's lost without Jesus. They, that person I can tell, I can share the hope that I have. I can share the stuff that I have to make that happen to keep this going forward. Because I don't think God wants the church to just putter to a stop in the last days and then he takes us all out and says, well done, good and faithful servant. You hunkered down quite well for the last 10 years of history. I think that God has a plan and a future for us, and it's pressing forward, 
even through our fears, and the same thing do an amazing thing through us and in us. So, God's promise, God's command to wait and do this in His way, in His time. You know, we can try and reach the world in our own power, but that's not very effective. But when God comes in and breathes on them, you, know, you can have all the wood stacked up, and you can tell people how they should be getting warm around this fire, but if there's no fire, no flame, there's no heat. And the Holy Spirit would come and kindle a fire and breathe it back into life. And maybe your life is like coals that have gone very down, very dark. You kind of, it's just like that little bit of spark in the middle of that black, black coal. And God would come down by the Spirit. The breath of God is another name for the Spirit of God. And God would come down and into you and nurse a fire. You know, when I was uh, doing a family reunion a few weeks ago, we got a magnifying glass, a very cheap one made out of plastic, didn't work very well. And we tried to start a fire in Colorado, well, not in Colorado, but I mean, on this little concrete part of their deck with the kids. It took us a long, long, long time. We nursed it, we worked on it, but the Bible says that that's how God is with us. It says the smoking flax, He won't distinguish. And a broken reed or bent reed, He won't break. He's gentle, and he's patient, and he's blowing in the coals of your life, even right now. Now that gift you have, now that ability, you know that longing to use it for me? And the Spirit would fan that to life in, the, in us as a church, and let us go out vibrant and alive and powerful and bold and in the world that he's put us in. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that we're going to see 10 days from this time where Jesus spoke these words and then ascended and went up to heaven, Lord. We're going to see where the Holy Spirit comes on them because they refused to try and win the world for Jesus before the Holy Spirit had come. They refused to do anything on their own. They had to wait for something. They didn't even know what it looked like. They just knew when it happened that they would know. And they waited. And then you did this powerful thing of pouring the Holy Spirit into them. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the kids, the adults here. Lord, would you make us children of God in every way possible. Enable us in our families, in our relationships to be lights and witnesses in Jesus' name.